Chapter 1. Arthur Hobhouse is a happening. I should begin at the beginning. I know that. But the trouble is, I don't know the beginning. I wish I did. I do know my name, Arthur Hobhouse. Arthur Hobhouse had a beginning, that's for certain. I had a father and mother, but goodness knows who they were. And maybe even he doesn't know for sure. I mean, God can't be looking everywhere all at once, can he? So where the name Arthur Hobhouse comes from, and who gave it to me, I have no idea. I don't even know if it's my real name. I don't know the date or the place of my birth either. Only that it was probably in Bermondsey, London, sometime in about 1940. The earliest memories I have are all confused somehow, and out of focus. For instance, I've always known I had a sister, an older sister. All my life she's been somewhere in the deepest recesses either of my memory or my imagination. Sometimes I can't really be sure which, and she was called Kitty. When they sent me away, she wasn't with me. I wish I knew why. I tried to picture her, and sometimes I can. I see a pale, delicate face with deep, dark eyes that are filled with tears. She is giving me a small key, but I don't remember what the key is for. It's on a piece of string. She hangs it around my neck and tells me I am to wear it always. And then sometimes I hear a laugh, an infectious giggle that winds itself up into a joyous cackle. My sister cackles like a kookaburra. She comes skipping into my dreams, sometimes singing London bridges falling down. And I try to talk to her, but she never seems to be able to hear me. Somehow we're always just out of reach from one another. All of my earliest memories are very much like dreams. I know that none of them are proper memories, none that I can really call my own anyway. I feel I've come out of half-forgotten, half-remembered times, and I'm sure I've often filled the half-forgotten times with made-up memories. Perhaps it's my mind trying to make sense of some of the unknown. So I can't know for certain where the made-up ones end and where the real ones begin. All the earliest childhood memories must be like that for everyone, I suppose. But maybe mine are more blurred than most. And maybe that's because I have no family stories to support them. No hard facts, no real evidence, no certificates, not a single photograph. It's almost as if I wasn't born at all, that I just happened. Arthur Hobhouse is a happening. I've been a happening for 65 years or thereabouts and the time has come now for me to put my life down on paper. For me this will be the birth certificate that I never had. It's to prove to me and to anyone else who reads it that at least I was just that. At least I happened. I am a story so as well as a happening I want my story to be known. I want Kitty to know it, if she's still alive. I want her to know what sort of brother she had. I want Zeta to know it too, although she knows me well enough already. I reckon, warts and all, I'd say. But most of all, I want Ali to know it, and for her children to know it. When they come along, and her children's children too. I want them all to know who I was, that I was a happening, I was a story. This way, I'll live on in them. I'll be part of their story. And I won't be entirely forgotten when I go. That's really important to me. I think that's the only kind of immortality we can have. That we stay alive only as long as our story goes on to be told. So I'm going to sit here, by the window, for as long as it takes, and tell it all just as I remember it. They say you can't begin a story without knowing the end. Until recently... I didn't know the end, but I do know, so I can begin. And I'll begin from the very first day I can be sure that I really remember. I'd have been about six years old. Strange that the memories of youth linger long, that they stay vivid, perhaps because we live our young lives more intensely. Everything is fresh, everything is for the first time and unforgettable, and we have more time just to stand and stare. Strange too that events of my more recent years my adult years are more clouded, less distinct. 
Time gathers speed and we get older. Life flashes by all too fast and it's over all too soon. Three Red Funnels and an Orchestra is Chapter 2. There were dozens of us on the ship, all ages, boys, girls, when we were all upon the deck for the leaving of Liverpool. Gulls wheeling, crying over our heads, calling goodbye. I thought they were waving goodbye. None of us spoke. It was a grey day with drizzle in the air. The great sad cranes bowing to the ships from the docks as we steamed past. That's all I remember of England. The deck shuddered under our feet. The engines thundered and throbbed as the great ship turned slowly and made for the open sea ahead. The mist rolling in from the horizon. The nuns had told us we were off to Australia, but it might as well have been the moon. I had no idea where Australia was. All I knew at the time was that the ship was taking me away, somewhere far away over the ocean. The ship's siren sounded again and again, deafening me, even though I had my hands over my ears. When it was over, I clutched the key around my neck, the key Kitty had given me, and I promised myself and promised her I would come back home one day. I felt in me at that moment a sadness so deep that it has never left me since, but I felt too that it's just as long as I had Kitty's key, it would always be lucky for me and I would be all right. I suppose we must have gone by way of the Suez Canal. I know that most of the great liners bound for Australia did that in those days, but I can't say I remember it. There's lots of things I do remember, though. The three pillar box red funnels, the sound of the orchestra playing from first class when we weren't allowed to go. Once they even played London Bridges Falling Down, and I love that because it always made me happy when I heard it. I remember mountainous waves higher than the deck of the ship, green or grey, or the deepest blue some days. Schools of silver dancing dolphins, and always, even in the most stormiest weather, seabirds skimming along the waves, or floating high above the funnels. And there was the wide, wide sea, all around us, going, it seemed to me, forever and ever, as wide as the sky itself. It was the wideness of it all that I remember, and the stars at night, the millions of stars. But best of all, I saw my first albatross. He flew out of the shining wave one day, came right over my head and looked down deep into my eyes. I've never forgotten that. The ship was in a way my first home, because it was the first home I can remember. We slept two to a bunk, a dozen or more of us packed into each cabin, deep down in the bowels of the ship, close to the pounding rhythm of the engines. It was cramped and hot down there and reeked of diesel and damp clothes. And there was often the stench of vomit too, a lot of it mine. I was in with a lot of other lads, all of whom were older than me. Some were a lot older. I was in trouble almost from the start. They called me a softy because I'd rock myself to sleep at night, humming London bridges falling down. And because I cried sometimes. One of them once found I'd wet the bed too. They'd never let me forgive it forget it. They gave me a hard time, a lot of grief. They thumped me with pillows. They'd hide my clothes, hide my shoes. But sending me to Coventry was worst, just refusing to speak to me, not even acknowledging my existence. I really hated them for that. They reserved this particular punishment for when I was at my most miserable, when I'd been seasick in the cabin. Seasickness was my chief dread. It came upon me often and violently. To begin with, I'd do what everyone else seemed to do. I'd vomit over the rail, if I could get there in time. It was while I was doing this one day that I first met Ma Marty. We were vomiting together side by side, and we caught one another's eye and shared each other's wretchedness. I could see in his eyes that it was just as bad for him. It helped somehow to know that. That was how our friendship began. Some kindly sailor came along and took pity on us both. He gave us some advice. When it gets rough, he told us, you should go below, as far down as you can go. It's the best place, because down there you don't feel the roll of the ship so much. So that's what we did, and it worked, mostly. Marty came down to my cabin, and where I'd go to his, but sometimes I'd get caught out and find myself having to be sick on the cabin floor. I'd clean it up, but I couldn't clean up the smell of it. So if I'd done it in my cabin, they'd send me to Coventry again. 
saying you're sending someone to Coventry is like saying, I don't want to speak to you, go away, I don't want to talk to you. It was to avoid having to face them that I sought out Marty's company once more. I think it was because I felt safe with him. He was a fair bit older than me, about ten he was. Older than the boys in my cabin and taller too, the tallest of all of us, and tall was important. I never asked him to protect me, not such, but I knew somehow he might, and as it turned out, he did. We were all up on deck, the two of us watching an albatross gliding along the waves, like me, Martin loved albatross. When a gang of these lads from my cabin were suddenly there behind us. They were northern lads, all of them. Sometimes I could hardly understand what they said. One of them, the ringleader, Wes Snarkley, he was called, started calling me names and taunting me. I can't remember why. I was nout but a poxy cockney. Marty stared at Wes for a moment. He just walked right up to him and knocked him flat. One punch. Then he said very quietly, I'm a cockney too. They all slunk away and after that life got a whole lot easier for me down in the cabin. When they say they're cockneys, it's a, a phrase, a name for people from London. They all slunk away and after that life got a whole lot easier for me down in the cabin. You might have been just as hot and sticky, just as crowded and smelly, but at least, more or less, they left me alone. All because of Marty. It was Marty who also explained it all to me. Why we were on a ship, why we were going and where. I don't know how much of anything I had understood before. We were going to Australia. That was all I knew for certain. All of us. Marty said he'd been specially chosen from the orphans in England to go and live in Australia. That's what he'd been told. Australia, he said, was a brand new country where there hadn't been a war, where there hadn't been bombings or rationing, where there was lots of food to eat, huge parks to play in and beaches too. We'd be able to go swimming whenever we liked. I told him I couldn't swim and he said he'd teach me that I'd soon learn, and he explained we weren't ever going to be sent to an orphanage again like the ones we'd grown up in. But instead, we were all going to live in families who wanted to look after us. So with all that to look forward to, it was worth being seasick for a while, wasn't it? Nothing was, being, nothing was worth being seasick for, I said, and I promised I would never set foot on a ship or a boat again, not for all the tea in China. It was a promise I singly failed to keep often. During that whole long voyage into an uncertain future, Marty cheered my spirits. He became like a big brother to me, which was why I confided in him about Kitty, about how she'd been left in behind in England and how much I missed her. I showed him the lucky key she'd given me. I could never think of her or even say her name without crying. But Marty never seemed to mind me crying. But he did mind me humming London Bridges falling down. said I was always doing it. And I could I not hum another tune? I said I didn't know any others. He told me that, like like it or not, Kitty would probably be coming out to Australia on another ship. There wasn't room for her on this one, which is why they hadn't let her on, and I'd see her soon again. That was Marty through and through, always hopeful, always so certain that things would work out. But Marty, as I discovered later, didn't just hope things would get better, he'd do all he could to make sure that they did. You need people like Marty just to keep you going, even if things don't seem to be working out quite as you'd like them to. You need to feel that they're going to, that all will be well in the end. If you don't believe that, and sometimes in my life I haven't, then there's a deep, dark hole waiting for you. A black hole that I came to know only too well later on. I learned a lot from Marty on the ship, about hope, about friendship. Mighty Marty, everyone called him, and it was a nickname that suited him perfectly. And we'll leave their journey there.